Welcome back to the channel, everybody. And the NFL draft has come and gone for 2023. Thanks for watching all the content that I posted for that draft weekend. If you missed some of the reaction videos or whatever, you can go check that out. You can also check out some of my final mock drafts leading up to it, maybe, and see how accurate I was because I did get a couple things right, uh, which is always the goal to get at least a little something right, even if you just get the positions right. Uh, for who they drafted. Sometimes it's hard to guess the exact player, especially the later you get in the draft. But I did my best, and of course, through that, you would know where I kind of ranked the players that were available, and 259 picks were made, and I've set up a grading system to grade every single team's drafts. And if you saw from the title of this video, we're going to start with the NFC. So let's do the grading on these draft classes all right i recorded that intro a week ago let's try this again how about that so let's start with the arizona cardinals and i thought they had a pretty darn good draft class uh i think they swung and missed with john Gaines. clayton tune i think has a real outside chance to be a starter at some point in this season because he is going to have the opportunity to compete for that starting role in rookie camp, in training camp, because Kyler Murray's going to be out. I like what they did in the late rounds. Owen Popoe, uh, Keytrell Clark, and Dante Stills, even at 213. All these guys are going to have opportunities to be starters because the Arizona Cardinals defense is so horrendously bad. Dante Stills has a real chance to fill in as one of their interior defensive linemen. They did lose Zach Allen and J.J. Watt. Keytrell Clark has a real chance to get significant playing time because they really don't have any corners on the roster they did draft Garrett Williams at 72 which I thought was good his injury concerns I think should be taken into account I thought there was a little bit better on the board he does have versatility so maybe they see him perhaps more as a safety down the line with them potentially losing Buda Baker but he's even if he's healthy at the beginning of the year, he's probably going to be corner one. Him and Marco Wilson are going to be corners one and corner two. And if Keytrell Clark performs even remotely well, he might be corner three. Michael Wilson is going to get significant playing time, I think. I think between him, it looks like they're keeping DeAndre Hopkins. So him and Hopkins and Rondell Moore with Marquise Brown mixed in there as well on the outside. Um, I think it's going to be... A very Kyler Murray's coming back to a pretty good receiving group. Um, then game BJ Ojolari to be an edge rusher. He's immediately their edge one, and then you let Maja Sanders sort of work his way potentially into being that edge two. I think Cameron Thomas now with the addition of BJ Ojolari will fill one of those, uh, maybe like the three four defensive end spot that was sort of hinted at at the beginning. But then you got Dante Stills in there, so that could be a competition there. Um, on for the, those third down uh, situations. And then Paris Johnson, you know, they traded back, got an extra first round pick, traded back up without giving it up. And they still got the guy that they were looking for at three. It was a very smart pick to get Paris Johnson. It gets a B, but BJ O'Jolari for me was their best pick with an A total after I added everything up. It's a, it's a B minus draft, B minus B draft. Um, I thought they could have done better. Uh, between 122 and 139. Here's the Atlanta Falcons, and this is the perfect time for me to jump in and just talk about how I graded late round picks. You saw with Arizona, they had some late round picks, but I felt because of the position their roster was in and what they did in free agency, that they had a real chance for those guys at those positions to get starters. So that's why I gave them a B. Most of the time, these late round picks are going to get a C grade. Just because when you're in these late rounds, you're generally just filling out depth at a certain position. And you're getting guys who can maybe play on special teams. You're getting sort of a mix of both. And we saw it here with Atlanta. Getting some depth on the on the interior offensive line. And getting DeMarco Hellams, who's another body in the secondary. But is likely going to be a special teamer if he makes the team. Their best pick was Clark Phillips at 113. I wasn't that high on Clark Phillips. But I thought he should have been at least, I would say, a third round pick. So them getting him that late. I thought it was a tremendous, tremendous steal. It doesn't now it doesn't really tie them down to Jeff Okuda uh, at all. So if Okuda comes out, plays well, you got Terrell, you got Okuda, and then you can have Clark Phillips playing in the slot. So it's gonna be. I think this was a perfect guy to fall for them based upon what they needed. 
And then they just hit solid doubles, I would say. Bijan Robinson, a little bit early, but he was the best player in the draft. So how do you give it less than a B? You know, he's still the best player probably in the draft. He's still going to be probably the best rookie from this class, at least in the rookie year. He's going to get all the opportunities. He's gone to the only team that ran the ball more than 50% of the time. Him and Tyler Algier, I think, are going to bounce off each other really well. You can pit him out in the slot as well to make some catches while Algier is in the backfield. There's just a lot that you can do there. Same thing with Matthew Bergeron. Sort of find a spot on the offensive line for him, for him to play. you got your tackle, so he's probably going to make his business playing at guard. Uh, probably Maybe a long-term tackle, uh, depending on what you get out of uh, Jake Matthews, how much longer you have with him. But he's Matthew Bergeron comes in, he plays guard opposite of Chris Lindstrom, and that really solidifies that offensive line. And then I think it's just you know finding a true top-of-the-line center, which I think that they could end up working out, especially if you put four solid bodies around the center. If you have four really solid guys, that fifth guy can usually get elevated pretty well. And Zach Harrison, 75, it was just a good pick. It was just a good, solid pick. Uh, long-term, you hope that it's Harrison and Arlda Bacchetti, uh, who you drafted on day two in the last two years, as your edge rushers for the next couple of years, and hope one of them breaks out as being a true number one. So here's the Carolina Panthers, and Bryce Young speaks for itself. It was the pick they should have made. Uh, after that, their day two picks, I wasn't a big fan. Jonathan Mingo, I get it. Just thought it was early for him. I understand the NFL might have been might have been high on him, and I did think that he could have been a guy that goes in the second round. I just didn't like it. I thought that they could have done a little a little bit better than Mingo. Uh, DJ Johnson, I thought that was a whiff considering who was available on the board at the time if they were going to go edge. I thought they made up for it with two solid picks on day two. On day three, I mean, with Chandler uh, Zavala. He could find those, his way into the starting lineup, perhaps. Uh, and then Jamie Robinson, with them moving Jeremy Chin, I think, to f- linebacker full time. I think he can find a spot, perhaps, on the back end. He'll have a real opportunity to compete and at least be safety three. And we know teams love running... Um, three safety packages now so he could get some significant playing time and I thought that he fell also a little bit I thought he would be more of a you know late day two pick than where he went at 145 C plus overall score they did they could have done so much better on day two here are the Chicago Bears and they made a lot of picks a lot of picks um you know those late picks, you see them there at the bottom of those last three picks. Those are guys who are going to be depth pieces like Travis Bell who might get an opportunity to compete for some for some uh, situational football minutes. Williamson and Terrell Smith probably going to end up being special teams assets. Noah Sewell will likely start in this uh, doing special team stuff, but getting him was an A for me. I thought he was a day two pick, like a late day two pick with the potential to be a top of the line linebacker in this class so with the additions that they made at the linebacker position they added tj edwards and they added tremaine edmonds if one of those guys perhaps doesn't work out then you can get out of one of those bigger contracts you got noah sewell in there who's going to be just linebacker three on that defense tyler scott at 133 i just didn't see the need for another wide receiver like that they got four wide receivers in there, I think they could have done been a little bit more economical with that pick. Roshan Johnson, I get it. Don't think he was the best one available for them. But I think pairing him up with uh, Khalil Herbert could be a, a decent run game. You know, you have Justin. You have to count Justin Fields as part of the run game as well. So he's the best running back on the team at the quarterback position. I like the Zach Pickens pick at sixty four. He's going to be a starting interior defensive lineman just based on who they have. I thought Gervin Dexter was a bit of a reach, uh, even though he was projected as a late first, early second round pick throughout the uh, early parts of the college football season. And he's going to start. I thought they could have done a little bit better, gotten a better player at that position. So I give it a C because it was a reach, but it is a guy who's going to get significant minutes. Tyreek Stevenson, I think, will eventually be... um, the outside starter with uh, Jalen Johnson by the end of the season if he doesn't start uh, day one. And Darnell Wright is your day one right tackle opposite Braxton Jones, and you hope that Jones can 
maintain what he did last year. And then you got your two bookend tackles and you can decide what you're doing on the interior with the guys that you have. Uh, you assume Nate Davis obviously is this, is going to be a solid guy moving forward as well. And then you got Cody Whitehair who there's been, you know, they've gone back and forth in the rumor mill about trading him, moving him to different positions. You got Tevin Jenkins, who, you know, up and down, are they going to stick with him? So now they can really focus on the interior uh, and developing the interior and getting the three best guys across that interior uh, with now your tackle position solved. And here's the Dallas Cowboys. They get a C minus. This just wasn't a great draft for them. Uh, nobody, nobody got less than a C minus in my grades. I thought that Everyone had just about, like, at worst, an average day because, you know, they did get Mozzie Smith. They did get Deuce Vaughn, who I think are going to get to see the significant amounts on the field for a first-round pick and a seventh-round pick or a sixth-round pick, whatever Deuce Vaughn was, late six. But then they get Luke Shoemaker at 58 where it's like you could have traded back and got more picks. You got DeMarvin Overshone at 90. Yeah, okay, but you could have got – you have so much – Better you could have done. Viliami Fihoko at 129. I just don't. That was. I don't like it. it was, that's a D. You know, Asim Richards, you know, you can maybe, if he has a really good camp, he could be a swing tackle. The sixth offensive lineman, maybe. Eric Scott. You needed a corner to develop. I guess this is where you get that. And if it doesn't really work out, you can invest highly in corner next year. Jalen Brooks at receiver. I mean, you traded for Brandon Cook, so I guess that took receiver really off the board. You hope Jalen Tolbert can step up. I thought the Cowboys could have done so much better than what they did. Um, a lot of just a lot of reaching and a very confusing draft strategy in general. Speaking of confusing draft strategies, the Detroit Lions in the first three picks they had in this draft it were real head scratchers. Jameer Gibbs at 12, I give it a D. He's going to be running back one on the roster. I'm just not convinced they needed to take him that high. I think they might have gotten played a little bit into thinking they needed to reach for him like that. I think they probably could have gotten him at 18. But they wanted Jack Campbell at 18. I think they could have gotten Jack Campbell at 34. You know, they got Brian Branch and Hendon Hooker in tremendous spots. That's why they get A grades. Brian Branch was drafted about... 15 to 20 spots later than I thought he would. Hendon Hooker was drafted just about where I anticipated he would be, but I think in terms of where he would fit in on this team and his skill set that he would bring, he will he will pretty much give you... You can assume that the, the worst-case scenario is that he's going to be what Jared Goff is right now, but you're getting him on a rookie contract rather than a $30-plus million contract. So it gives you some leeway to get out of that. Broderick Martin, don't know what they were doing with that. They traded up for that, I think. That's brutal. That was just bad. And then, you know, like I said, the late picks. These are, you know, offensive line depth again. Antoine Green probably just going to make his money on special teams. But the thing is here, if Jameer Gibbs doesn't turn out to be a top 10 running back, then that's a that's a, you punted that pick away. And then to go linebacker, you took really the two least valuable positions on either side of the football. So in terms of positional value, they just didn't hit it out of the park for me. Sam Laporte, I gave a C just because he does feel a need for them. I just thought with Michael Mayer on the board, with Darnell Washington on the board, they could have been so much better off um, going with one of those guys instead. And here are the Green Bay Packers with a ton of picks. And they hit on some, didn't hit on others. On uh, my initial seven-round prediction, I had them doubling up at tight end and getting a receiver, uh, which they did. Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft. I think I had Musgrave and Zach Koontz being the ones that I predicted. Uh, they reached on Jane Reed, which was I give him a C. I thought they could have done way better than that. Uh, I knew that Jane Reed would probably be – he was a candidate to be one of the guys that really got a reach – reached on they also drafted Dontavian Wicks so I guess between Wicks and Jane Reed you're hoping to get a true starter starting caliber wide receiver there Grant DeBose they got at the end I think it's more special teams sort of dart throw like they had with uh, Samari Toure last year uh they drafted a kicker Ugh. 
I did like the Carl Brooks and Colby Wooden picks. I thought those think those guys have a real opportunity to sort of get mixed in there on the interior defensive line with Devontae Wyatt and Kenny Clark. So they'll get a lot of early down work uh, for sure. At least one of them will. It's always good to have a nice healthy rotation there and also to give yourself options uh, on the interior defensive line when you have that many picks and that many guys are falling. Uh, Sean Clifford be looking like he's going to be the backup quarterback there. If all else fails with Jordan Love, maybe he sees the field a bit. You hope not. Uh, and I thought their first round pick, they hit it out of the park. It needed to be an edge or a receiver. I think going Lucas Van Ness, I'm perfectly okay with that, especially because what they did on, on day two, getting the, the tight ends and the wide receiver. I thought that they more than made up for it. But Lucas Van Ness, to me, was a potential top 10 pick. And he's going to come in and play right away. And it also allows him to move on from Preston Smith. And you can have Van Ness and Rashawn Gary be your two edge rushers uh, moving forward with Kingsley Nagbari sort of working his way in um, to rotational playing time. And then you can just fill in with other uh, role-playing guys with specific traits to fill out the uh, edge room. But very good pick for Lucas Van Ness. Another team that made a ton of picks is the Rams. They get a C. They started strong. Avila, Byron Young, Kobe Turner, those are the those were the positions they needed to address. Those are the spots they needed to fill. I thought they did them with some decent players. There was a little bit better on the board available at the time, in my opinion. But they still did what they were supposed to do, which is why they get Bs. I really liked getting THT there at 182. That was, to me, their best pick in terms of player talent value where they got him. Uh, Zach Evans at 215. Thought that was a good pick as well. Uh, I throw C's at them for those last three picks, you know. And then they're, after that, Stetson Bennett at 128. Why? Why? You know, if Matthew, if your team stinks, then you're going to be using a, a top pick on a quarterback next year anyway. So why are you taking Stetson Bennett now when Matthew Stafford is going to be your starter? Like, you're either going to stink and get Caleb Williams and Drake May, or you're going to be good, and then you won't, and then you're just going to use Matthew Stafford continuously, obviously. Uh, Then they, you know, average picks at best from 161 to 177 there, filling out some spots on the roster, gaining some depth and stuff. Nick Hampton could potentially end up starting. Um, Doesn't mean I'm any higher on him as a player, but him and O'Shawn Mathis, I think, could potentially compete to be edge number two to Byron Young's edge one, uh, which I think also goes to speak to how poor that Rams uh, roster really looks now that those top-level superstars are not there anymore, and it's really just Aaron Donald and Cooper Cup with Matthew Stafford, and that's really it on that entire roster, so... A lot of rebuilding they're going to have to do, and they have to hope that a lot of these picks do hit and they get some good production out of these guys. And here are the Minnesota Vikings. They get a C plus. You know, they had some good picks and some meh picks. I really like Dwayne McBride at 222. Depending on what they do with Dalvin Cook, he could get starter minutes. He's at least going to fill that role um, as a backup, get some backup reps in there. Uh, Jaron Hall, again, sort of like with the Stetson Bennett pick. I'm just like, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Like, if you stink, you're going to get a top of a quarterback. If you don't, then you're going to keep Kirk Cousins. So, kind of a waste. Jacqueline Roy, decent pick. That was good based upon his posi- uh, position in the draft and how he's potentially going to get used. Jay Ward and Makai Blackman. I mean, I ugh, I get it. They're going to get starter minutes. I just think they could have done way better. Uh, but those guys are going to get an opportunity to prove me wrong. Almost immediately, because with how weak that corner room is, they're going to play. And then Jordan Addison is going to be wide receiver two on this roster. Potentially have a great season uh, with Justin Jefferson uh, as the the alpha in that room. Uh, But it'll be interesting to see how that works out. He wasn't my favorite wide receiver uh, in this draft. I knew he was going to get drafted probably in the first round. Doesn't mean I like it any better. And here are the New Orleans Saints. This was my, one of my better predicted teams as well for my seven-round mock. I had them going interior defensive line, edge, and then running back with their first three picks. That's exactly what they did. Brian uh, Brzee fell to them. I think that's a perfect pick for them at, at 29. That gets an A grade. 
Isaiah Foskey at 40, he's going to get some starter reps. I just thought there was a little bit better, but that's a B. Keandre Miller, I hate that pick. I hate it. He's not a better option than Jamal Williams. Uh, There were better running backs on the board, significantly better running backs on the board. So I give it a D grade. Uh, Sal DeVere, he's okay. He's okay. Uh, Same thing with Jordan Howden. I have to give him a C just because, you know, might see the field a little bit, but mostly special teams guy. Jake Hayner, again, same sort of idea as the Rams and the Vikings before him. Why? It makes no sense to go a quarterback in that situation that late. Uh, and I do like the A.T. Perry pick. He could potentially sneak his way onto significant playing time. So, But, again, very questionable quarterback pick decisions going on from a lot of these teams that are like kind of looking like they're potentially going to be quarterback needy soon but aren't right now, and it's really dependent on what their season is going to look like. The Saints really just you know, completed that threesome. And here are my New York Giants, and we'll start with Deontay Banks. I really wanted Joey Porter. To me, Joey Porter is the better player overall. We'll probably have the better career. doesn't mean I don't think Deontay Banks is going to be a good player. I do think he is, and I think especially with Wink Martindale. Whatever corner went to Wink Martindale's defense in this situation, as long as they went in the first two rounds, this guy's going to have the chance to really develop into being a star. So Deontay Banks is going to be a good player. I give it a B. I thought they could have done slightly better with Joey Porter Jr. But then they hit two home runs in a row. John Michael Schmitz is going to come in, be a starter. This has got potentially Creed Humphrey written all over it, where he just came in and was one of the top centers in the NFL immediately. John Michael Schmitz has that ability to be that. Uh, And then Jalen Hyatt, I give it an A as well. This is somebody who's just going to blow the top off the defense. Played a lot in the slot in Tennessee, but he's got some size to him that he can end up potentially playing on the outside and become really the better version of Darius Slayton and what Giants fans were hoping Darius Slayton could become. Where a much more consistent version, because Darius Slayton's had some really great moments, but then he really falls off. He'll disappear for months at a time and then have like a couple big games and then just disappear again we're hoping that Jalen Hyatt is the more consistent version of that it's somebody that can be molded uh as well by Dable and uh Kafka and then they just hit then they just you know they hit singles for the rest of the way out Eric Gray's coming in as a depth running back um Hawkins and Owens you know they like playing a lot of um defensive backs at a time and there are opportunities for people to break out there we saw it with um what's his face why is his name escaping me but he played a ton at corner this past year for the giants and i never heard of him anyway that's exactly i think that shows because i know pretty much everyone on the giants team they're on my team and jordan riley comes in as a nose tackle um, it allows it'll allow them for much more bigger sets because they got Runia's um, uh, Runia, Nunez Roches and stuff who are smaller guys. So you went Jordan Riley and Dexter Lawrence on those early downs, those run sh- um, short yardage situations. You got two giants, two three hundred fifty plus pound guys just boom plowing in there. That's that to me is going to be a really fun situation. And here are the Philadelphia Eagles, and they they made the only significant player trade. Uh, in this draft, uh, and that was for DeAndre Swift. I gave it a B just because Swift is, he's got a year left on his deal, so it was really just a, whatever, you take a fifth round flyer out on him basically is what they did, which he can end up being a starting running back, somebody they can potentially re-sign, so I have to give it a B. It's just he's injury prone, so he might not stick around. Their worst pick was Tyler Steen at 65. I thought they could have done so much better than that. But everything else after that, like the two Georgia players, the three Georgia players, they all get A's. Jalen Carter's, you know, potentially the best defensive player in the whole draft. Nolan Smith is going to be a tremendous edge rusher, potentially in the NFL. Keely Ringo had really just this last year where he wasn't great. Every other, he, he was great every other time for Georgia. And he's going to get a chance to develop behind Bradbury and Darius Slay. They even got Tanner McKee, who was like my quarterback 
uh, six in this draft. He's going to come in. He'll be a backup for Jalen Hurts. They'll develop him, probably be able to flip him for something else. Uh, at least be one of the better backups in the NFL moving forward. It's just his mobility is a real issue. Uh, Moro Ajamo, who could have been a day two pick if it wasn't for you know some questionable character concerns. But if that if that works out, getting him at two forty nine, you might have drafted your t- two of your top three interior defensive linemen for the next five, six, seven years with Carter Ajamo, and then they of course they have Jordan Davis from last year. It was just it as a Giants fan, it makes me sick that they did this well in this draft. And they probably had the best draft out of anybody, uh, including the DeAndre Swift trade. It just makes me sick. Makes me sick to say. And here are the San Francisco 49ers. And again, very questionable draft strategy. They started strong with Jair Brown, safety from Penn State. Him and uh, Hufanga will start together, likely. At least at some point uh, during the for, during uh, the next season. But then they drafted Jake Moody at 99. Why? No court, No kicker should ever go in the top 100. I'm sorry. Cameron Latou at 101. Why? Not a not the even the best tight end on the board, but they had so many other needs that they needed to address. And so many good players that could have addressed them. Looter, I mean, okay. I thought Beal and Winters were good picks considering the spot they got taken. And then, you know, again, like I was saying for those late round picks, drafting special teams contributors uh seems it's hard to it's hard to to be like oh that's a D pick because this guy stinks. It's like well they got him at two fifty five to play special teams, and then he, if he does well on special teams, he might potentially break out and be a giant steal in the draft. So a lot of it's just flyers filling depth spots. So they get C's there, but that ninety nine and one hundred one they could have done so much better, and it really would have turned their whole draft around considering who was available on the board. They took a corner. There, you see, they took a corner at 155. If at 99, they took Keely Ringo. And then at 101, they maybe take somebody like Luke Weipler or somebody like that. And then you could have had an interior offensive lineman spot filled. The center position would have been filled now. There was just so much the better they could have done. It would have made a world of a difference in their overall draft grade. And here's the Seattle Seahawks. If it wasn't for... Some eh, picks, they started so strong on the first two days. Devon Witherspoon, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, home run picks. JSN's going to start as your slot. Devin Witherspoon's going to start opposite of Tariq Woolen at corner, and you've got your cornerback room and your wide receiver room now solved. Long term with the players that you've drafted over the last couple of years, it's solved. Now it's a matter of just filling in pieces for depth and situational football at those positions for the next, couple, for the next half a decade. Uh, Derek Hall comes in. He'll be edge three out the gate, but positioning to eventually take over with Boya Mafe. And then you have Uchana Nwosu probably on his way out. Unless Boya Mafe completely stinks, then you keep Nwosu and Mafe ends up out after his rookie contract's up. Then they got Zach Charbonnet. I give it a B. Um, I understand the strategy pairing him up with Kenneth Walker. Also because Seattle, they get there's a lot of injury concerns and stuff with their running back room. So you want to get guys in there. Uh, that you can rely on that could be quality, uh, especially because you don't want Geno Smith to be throwing the ball so much because, you know, down the stretch he did kind of fall off a little bit. The quality of his play kind of fell off a little bit as Kenneth Walker was no longer available uh, as, you know, there was just not a lot of depth at the running back position. So you want to have that uh, continuously moving. Then they addressed the interior offensive line kind of like they did last year with the tackles, Cross and Abraham Lucas. They potentially landed the final two pieces of their interior offensive line. Now, they signed Evan Brown. Olu Oluwatimi is going to start. They got him at 154. I guarantee you he starts week one. At center, Evan Brown will start at guard. And then Anthony Bradford's going to have a chance to start at the other guard. He'll compete with Damian Lewis. And he'll give them, at the very least, the third. Maybe he'll even compete with Evan Brown, to be honest. But that'll be a great fourth interior guy regardless of what they get. I thought they could have done better. I could. I thought Luke Weipler would have been a better pick because then he could have played, he could have been almost a guaranteed position at guard with Olu with Timmy playing the center position. Uh, Cameron Lewis, good depth on the interior. Mike Morris, another edge guy, a different type of edge player, a bigger one. You know, they did get Draymond Jones 
So it may be a little bit redundant with him and Mike Morris. But also you want to put yourself in a position where if you catch an injury, you get some bigger guys on early downs, that you have players that can replace that role of maybe a highly paid player like a Draymond Jones. So I thought that was a really good pick too. Uh, Jarek Reed was kind of a, you know, whatever, depth pick. I didn't like the Kenny McIntosh pick because they did go Zach Charbonnet. So I thought that was a bit of a wasted pick. Um, but he'll be good. He would be good for depth in the event that Walker picks up an injury because then Charbonnet and McIntosh are sort of split responsibilities based upon the situation. I'm just not going to bank on Kenneth Walker getting hurt for a significant amount of time for Kenny McIntosh to have really take on a significant role. Uh, so I thought they could have maybe gone a bit of a different direction. But McIntosh, he could potentially excel. But again, I just I just thought it, going two running backs in the same draft is kind of ugh, not great, especially when you went running back last year. Here's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I give them a C plus. I didn't hate any of their picks. Didn't particularly love any of their picks either. Kalijah Kansi, a little bit early for him, but he was always a boomer bust player anyway. So I think that no matter where he kind of went, it was always going to be a B grade for me because they draft him at 19 expecting him to boom. You know, and there's that's if he booms, it's an A. If he doesn't, it's an F. Because and it's an F and they should have known better. Or he booms and they're like, it's an A, and everyone should have known better. So he's the most volatile uh prospect that there was in this draft. Cody Mock is gonna come in, he'll start right away. Uh good pick. I would maybe prefer for them to go tackle though. Uh Yaya Diaby is gonna have an opportunity to get some significant playing time. I knew he would go pretty early. I knew he'd probably be a third round pick. Uh I had him, I think, going to Denver. It was like Denver's second pick of their of their draft. I think I thought I had him going in my initial seven round prediction mock. I still think he was maybe more of a day three pick. Uh, again, those three guys they took there, Dennis, Durham, and Hayes, they're for sure going to see some special teams time. And depending on what happens with Devin White, Dennis could see some more playing time. Hayes, depending on where they see him in the defensive back room, could find his way onto the field maybe more than we expect. And Payne Durham's going to have an opportunity to compete for the tight end spot with Kate Otten and Cole Kreift, who they took the year last year. Uh, Trey Palmer, I thought, was a sneaky good pick. Their wide receiver room is old and slow. So Trey Palmer can come in and be give a little bit of juice, hopefully, and could be a real late round steal. And then Jose Ramirez at edge, just an edge depth guy, I think, more than anything else. And here are the Washington Commanders, who I thought had a horrendous first two days and then really made up for it on day three. Uh, Forbes, I thought was a terrible pick. He's 6'1", 165. I'm six foot 168. I should not be out there on an NFL field trying to tackle guys who are 200 pounds. Uh, I think that Forbes in college is going to find out that the NFL game is different. And when he's going up against some of the guys he's going to have to go up against in the NFL, I'm looking particularly at A.J. Brown. He's drafted at 16 to be the guy to go and cover a guy like A.J. Brown. He's drafted at 16 to be a guy to go and cover D.K. Metcalf and Debo Samuel and even C.D. Lamb and Justin Jefferson. And I just don't think, I don't think this is going to work out. Uh, Jartavius Martin is another one. I give it a D grade. Is he a safety? Is he a corner? Either way, he was picked way too high. Ricky Stromberg is going to probably see the field. He's going to get a chance to compete. Uh, give it a C for that. I did like Brain Daniels. I thought that Brain Daniels pick was better than Ricky Stromberg's pick. I thought he was a better player than Stromberg. And to get him after Stromberg, I think he's more likely to play, at least early on. KJ Henry has a real opportunity with Chase Young on his way out. Clearly, if Chase Young doesn't have a breakout year, he'll see the field less and less and less as the season goes on. Uh, Chris Rodriguez has a real opportunity to, to be the replacement to Antonio Gibson and pair up with Brian Robinson going forward for the next couple of years. And if this opens them up to move on from Antonio Gibson, perhaps, uh, to, you know, get get a sixth round pick, even be a training camp cut guy. And then Andre Jones as an edge depth guy, sort of the same idea as KJ Henry. He's going to get a chance to compete. He was just, I think, maybe too late 
down the line might not have the talent level in order to sub- to supplant a guy like KJ Henry, who sort of lived in the shadow of a lot of those Clemson defensive linemen anyway. So he's gonna have he's gonna have more of an opportunity, I think, than Jones to really show up. And I think he's more likely because of how great that Clemson defense was for so long with KJ Henry on that roster as well, that he's now going to get a chance to really shine at the pro level that he really wasn't able to at the college level. And there it is. The entire NFC draft class is graded. Tell me what you think in the comments section below. And of course, stay tuned for my AFC video, which is coming out shortly after that. So it might already be up. Um, If not, Still subscribe, and you'll see it when it pops up, when I finally post it, which will probably be the day after this is posted. So enjoy, thank you, and I will see you guys with the next video.